Today, I'm going to be sharing with you a sneak peek of some of the things we've been working for for Unreal Engine 5.4. The first thing we want to talk about are improvements that we've made to rendering. Now, we've been working on the rendering engine since UE5 with some really amazing technology. So things like Lumen and Nanite are being used in this scene. So right now, all we're seeing is that kind of wispy snow represented across that landscape with the help of a normal map. If we were to look at the triangles, you'll see that I actually have Nanite enabled. There we go. Um, and across that terrain, Nanite's turned on. That's why we're seeing the colorful polygons but there's not enough detail or, or tessellation in there to capture that displacement, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually enable Nanite tessellation, which is gonna add another level of tessellation on top of that original landscape that will be have um, enough polygons to capture that detail. And it's really easy to do inside of Unreal. All you have to go and do is grab your landscape and just gonna scroll down here and bring up that material. It's a little large, let's just shrink that down. And we'll kind of scroll down to the bottom here and just scoot this over so you can see what's going on. I'm just going to turn on tessellation. As soon as we do that, now there's a lot of polygons, right? Tons and tons of detail in that landscape. And you can start to see the subtle little contours of some of those areas that previously were just normal map representations. And if I overdrive the, uh, the value of the snow, it's just a multiplier on that, on that displacement channel that's kind of going into that guy. You can start to see, OK, yeah, that's, that's all displaced uh, geometry now. You can start to really see that. And if we jump back to a lip mode, it's going to just add that really nice subtle detail scattered across that terrain. So, so the final thing that we're going to look at is uh, kind of combining all those together. It's kind of some of the landscape stuff with some of the texturing stuff. And we're going to do that in the context of a character running around my environment. So I based this scene out of the, uh, the third person template. So as I start to run my character around here, you can see they're leaving um, you know, these nice little footprints in the snow. And they're all displaced out. That's just basically sampling each foot rendering that into a runtime virtual texture, taking that runtime virtual texture and multiplying that into the displacement channel of the original texture map that came from Quixel. So putting it all together, we end up with landscapes that's deformable. So you know, tire tracks, snow, mud, things like that. You can do very, very efficiently and elegantly utilizing all these tools together. So let's, uh, let's talk about localized volume fogs. Now, I do have a little bit happening right here. And the way I'm getting that is using localized volume fog. It's a new feature in 5.4, and it gives you very art-directable um, fog placement. So let's go ahead and check that out. What does it mean? Well, if I just search for local, and I grab this localized fog volume, and if I uh, you know, kind of hit my G key here, you can see there, there's that localized fog. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take that localized fog, and I'm just going to duplicate it. And then we'll just drag it across here and start adding in a little bit more fog mist at the base of those mountains. So really simple thing, but it makes a big impact in the ability for artists to get exactly the look and feel they want in their fog. You know, It gives you another level of control or another layer to work with. Super powerful feature. So the next thing that we want to talk about really quickly is heter heterogeneous volume and some of the improvements we've made to the volume renderer. First of all, the direct illumination model has the ability to cast shadows into the environment. So if we go up here and we just turn on cast shadows, go to the details for that guy, you can see, all right, great, now we have shadows. That's a pretty fundamental thing. We didn't have that in 5.3, so I'm really glad that's there. What we're trying to do with a lot of our tools in the editor is bring them a, the level of usability to, a, to a, an initial state that artists can work with them very fast and iteratively. And we approached rigging slightly different for 5.4 with a new workflow called modular rigging. So let's go ahead and, and get this guy into the modular control rig workflow. Now, the modular rigging workflow is, is kind of a wizard-based workflow, right? Like, when you bring it in here, you can see there's this thing called a socket. It's, it's basically saying, hey, I've identified this bone off of the root bone. This is probably an area that your first area that you're going to want to interact with when you're, when you're animating this, this vehicle. So let's, let's put a controller there. The controller that we're going to add to it is just a simple, um, it's called add controller. This is basically like a, like a parent constraint inside of Maya. It's kind of the easiest way to think of it. It's going to grab it and, and grab the translation and rotation scaling. All that stuff's going to come along for the ride. Actually, let's wake up the front wheels. Solid axles are kind of tough to, to rig in a traditional rigging system, right? I want, I want to, as an animator, just grab a wheel and position it. I want the other wheel to kind of counterbalance itself and know what to do. That's actually really easy to do with a piston. So let's check out how that workflow would look. Let's just grab this bone. And I'm going to look at my rig hierarchy. You can see I've got axle start. I'm going to right click on that. And I'm going to say, you know what? I want a new socket right there. Give me a socket to put one of these modules on. I'm going to grab out that piston, drag it and drop it on there. Now, as soon as I do that, um, it's added it. You can see over here in my, in my uh, modular hierarchy, it's there. 
You can't see it in the, uh, in the viewport, and that's just because the controllers are a little bit small, so I'm gonna make those big because I wanna be able to grab them kind of near my tires. Now, I've got two controllers that just showed up, and they're gray. The reason they're gray is they haven't been added into the hierarchy of my character, my modular character here. It's not underneath the root. Notice that there's some color setting here in the module settings. As soon as I drag and drop that under the root, they know where they are. They know that they're on the right-hand side of the character, so they're, they're color-coded, giving me that visual cue that they are now in the hierarchy. Like, I know they're there because they're not gray, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just drag that other controller over to the other side of the vehicle, kind of position it where I want it to be, and just like that, I now have a control system that lets me grab you know, one tire or the other tire. Very, very fast, very easy. You could do this in Control Rig, yeah, of course you could. You could do it in Maya, Blender, Houdini, wherever. It's really, really fast to do it here. An artist can do it in a matter of seconds here, and that's the real power of the modular Control Rig. So to finish this guy up, I'm just gonna add a couple of um, more, more constraints, more modules onto these, uh, these, these shock absorbers. So we'll grab that one, we'll grab that one. I'm gonna go back to the original rig hierarchy and I'm gonna say, you know what? I need sockets. These are things I want to interact with. I'm gonna go ahead and just grab that piston, drag and drop it on top of there. And again, it's, it's made it, you can't really see it because it's kind of, it's, it's a little small, but I'll just increase the size of that. And we'll just drag and drop that again underneath the root. And just like that, we now have that module. So if I grab this guy and slide it down toward the end, that controller's in the right spot. So if I grab it and begin moving it, what's it gonna do? It's actually going to take that bottom bone and aim at it, right? It's, like I said, it's two bones aiming at each other. But here's the interesting thing. You don't have to populate all these fields. Like some of them need to be populated for the bare minimum for the, for the module to work. It does that automatically. But if I want more functionality in this, I might have to map in a few other bones. So what happens if I translate this up and down? Well, because I haven't defined the end bone, it doesn't know to actually pull that end bone along for the ride. So how do you fix that? Well, all you have to do is map it in, right? So we can deselect this. We can go in here and grab. Actually, it's probably easier just to grab it here. Let's grab that guy get ourselves sort of the end bone. And I'm just gonna come over here and I'm gonna say end bone, use that as the input. So now what we have is we've got a piston that goes up and down. We want this controller to be part of the hierarchy of the truck, so we're gonna grab that bone and we're gonna parent the end bone into that. So we'll just go to parent bone end, hit the map button. So now I've got the ability to grab my truck and we can kind of hide those guys and just grab this and I move it up and down. It does what I would expect, right? Now, here's the cool thing. I'm just gonna take this guy and I'm gonna mirror it across to the other side. So we'll say mirror. We're looking, uh, I did the left side today. So we'll do underscore L. We're gonna match over to underscore R. We'll hit okay. And in a matter of a second, we've got another rig. If I grab this, you know, it just does what you want. Very, very fast. So animation tools inside of Unreal have also, uh, also been getting better, a lot better. Um, set a key there and maybe I'll set a key here. And if I move forward in time, and I turn on auto key, which it looks like it's already on, you know, I can begin using the new gizmos. So the new gizmos are really great. Um, as an animator, I can just use my middle mouse button. I don't actually go in there and actually touch that. It's gonna auto key for me. So as a poser, you know, I can just hit my E key, middle mouse button to kind of move this guy around, hit the E key again, it goes to a free uh, arc ball. So you cycle through the E key, it locks to the camera plane, hit it again, it goes into an arc ball. So you can kind of just really quickly with your keys, you know, jump around and not having to go in there and actually grab that stuff to set keyframes and animate this character, uh, it's much, much faster. Another thing worth noting is in our anim details, if we were to bring up the graph editor, you can use, or the curve editor, you can use this um, anim details as a actual filter system to say, you know what, show me only that translation or that translation. So it's a really nice filtering system. All these little things have been going into the tools to make them more artist friendly, faster for animators to work with. So I've got that, third person character that has some motion on it. I want to hijack that animation and put it onto my own custom snow character. I want to retarget animation onto this guy, right? So to do that, all I have to do is kind of go back here and go on to this, right click and say retarget animation. So this is the retargeting window. It's actually had a good bit of work put into it in 5.4. You can resize it, first of all, that's new. Um, and what it does is it, it lets you in one click, retarget a character. So we're gonna just grab our retarget character. We'll just throw a little, uh, little, little animation on there so you can see, just like that, it knew you know, this character was my source, this character was my target, it recognizes it, it does it. Now, of course, if you wanted to, you could now batch export all of those. 
um, animations out. You can also export the retarget assets, which means if you wanted to do like a runtime retarget, you could do that really quickly. It's autom automatically set up for you. You just export them out and use it with the runtime retargeter. So insanely powerful tool. All right, so here we are. And as I run my little guy around, you can see I've got these nice arc animations happening as I run this guy. If I do some starts or some stops, you know, really good transitions. And this is using, again, a very sparse data set. Let's go ahead and jump back and just, I'll show you the, the clips for this. It's using 12 clips. It's ridiculously good looking animation for this limited number of data sets. The ability for it to went, you know, transition and match and, and select the right clip and do the warping and the blending and make it just all look great for 12 clips, amazing. So and here's, here's a fun thing, like if we pull up the, uh, the database, you can see here's, here's the initial database, this is it. It's just, it's just a, you know, it's a few arcs, a couple starts, a couple stops, you know, not, not a lot in there. And it, it really is, even though it's a simple example, it's actually doing some very sophisticated things. We're using the root bone offset for the initial kind of local motion. And that's, that's a new experimental plugin. Off of that root bone offset, where then the motion matcher, it kind of gives it the angle and then the motion matcher selects the correct clip based off of that angle off the root bone offset. And then it does like a little bit of blending and warping and magic and it just gives you these really nice animations. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do PCG first and then we'll do audio. So if you look at my landscape, there's areas that are flattened around the bases. I'm using a very simple PCG setup to do this. I'm basically taking landscape patches that let me flatten it down. I'm finding the volume of that landscape patch in the outer perimeter, and I'm doing a difference of those two. And that gives me the ability to basically get the border of my base. Here, we'll, we'll grab this building over here, and I start moving it around. You're gonna see it's gonna go through. PCG rebuilds the flat spots, or the, the landscape patch plugin rebuilds the flat spots. PCG uses that as a reference and then it builds out off of that. And if I hold down my Alt key, actually, because I have the gizmos on, Alt does not work. If I duplicate that and slide it across, add another building in there, it just goes through, it just works. Very, very powerful feature. If you wanna see the graph, come over to the pod and I can walk you through that a bit more in detail. All right, thanks for your time all. If you want more, come over to the pods, we'll be there. Cheers.